then uh, we'll have a short panel discussion. Uh, Evgeny, having the privilege of uh, being the last speaker, has uh, commented on, on where he's uh, kind of taking issue or disagreeing with, with uh, the previous speaker. And uh, that is, of course, the high, one of the aims of, of Coconomics co and Coco is to highlight different of, of opinion. And I would like to, to ask you, uh, Kalle, uh, listening to, to uh, uh, both Paul and Evgeny, uh, where are you taking issue or, or disagreeing with them? Uh, not at all. I think uh, I think uh, they told different stories that both were interesting and and valuable. I think uh, emphasizing different uh, aspects somewhat. So I have a, a little picture that we try out on you. So that if you think about um, the history of whatever capitalism. There was first, you had roving bandits. They were traveling around and sort of stealing and things. And then you get some stationary bandits, and they were protecting against the roving bandits. But they came from the same pool. And you see this again and again. And I think that some of the things that are happening here, that you have somebody protecting and somebody attacking, but they are basically drawn from the same pool. And they are created, uh, those who attack, they are creating the demand for protection. And those who protect, they sort of can charge uh, uh, high ban high uh, fees for, for, for doing this. And there's some of the things that are happening in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, at least what you described in, in the end here. And, uh, I, I think there's this analogy, and you're going to be a squeeze of all of us, because we are in part attacked, but we have to pay a lot of protection fees. And you see this, uh, uh, you see this in, 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 in other contexts than, than this, but here it's more in the abstract. You saw it in Russia after the, uh, after the revolution in the 1990s, so you, saw, you are seen in Africa protection mm. firms and, 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 and roving bandits uh, moving around. You see it in Afghanistan, you see many places, and you also see it in, in, in the digital world uh, yeah. that you described. I, I think it's really interesting. So I like both presentations, no disagreement. In details, of course, maybe that's a lack of understanding on my part. <laughs> uh, following up on your point, Paul, about uh, the marginal cost of uh, information uh, goods being mm. zero, um, if we foresee government uh, moving in the same direction as they did with the mon monopolies before mm. uh, First World, World, World War I, mm. uh, uh, do, uh, doing an, an active anti-monopoly mm. uh, regulation, uh, couldn't we foresee that actually the profit of those companies uh, shrinking dramatically and the prices of those information goods also trending towards zero. I, I absolutely think that that is what would happen. And in fact, one of the one when I talk about what I would do uh, and why in the book I left the way open uh, towards policy responses is that one policy response is to simply be more capitalist. That is, what would it mean? It would mean the director general director general generality of competition, the DG competition in Brussels, must create 10 Facebooks. They must say, just like your banks, I think your banks similar to ours, I can take my money out of my bank, move it to the, another bank in 24 hours, and it's the same money. That this new bank has to trade with the other bank. When I pay with my credit card, all banks are trading with each other. Why can't we have six or 10 providers of friendship services online where the data is interoperable. Why not? Because Facebook will kill everybody on the planet to stop this. And I think it will, it, the, if, if you want, it, it, what did Frederick da Jameson used to say, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. It's easier to imagine an asteroid hitting the earth with dinosaurs jumping off it uh, than it is to imagine the competition directorate of Europe breaking up Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Facebook. Uh, uh, just remind uh, people about uh, so the, the end of capitalism. That, that's not a very radical idea. Mm. So the, Josef Schumpeter, he wrote a book in 1943, and he, he raised two questions. He said, can capitalism survive? And he said, oh no, of course it can't. Can socialism uh, work? Of course it can. But it isn't good, but it can work. And then he gave the reasons why, why sort of 
It was very mm. different from the Marxian yeah, yeah. explanation yeah. Uh, for, for why uh, capitalism would be, come to an end. And that was bureaucratization. And, and many people think that everything that's private is non-bureaucratic, that this is private and efficient. But what is happening in the private sector is actually a, pro a bureaucratization of the private sector itself. You have, you have heard two excellent uh, presentations or aspects of that. But there's a huge process of bureaucratization of private enterprises within themselves, the way they compete, the monopoly practices uh, between them, that is really costly uh, to it. And that sounds more like what uh, Schumpeter described in uh, 1943, but it takes place in the private sector. Can I just add something? Am I, am I on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so if you look, the reason why I spend so much time looking at Silicon Valley, for example, is not because this is where all those firms are concentrated. You know, if you look at China, for example, they, for very good reasons now, have a technology industry that's almost as robust as the American one. Right? And that, I think, has to do primarily with the fact that Chinese build a great firewall, and while everybody in Europe thought that it's just the greatest instrument of repression and censorship, Chinese thought of it primarily as a trade instrument, and that was a way to prevent American mm -hmm. firms yep. from swallowing up their own domestic markets, and this is why in China you have their own uh, search engines, social networks, and everything else. China is the only competitor that currently exists to the American uh, sort of giants. But what I wanted to say is that the reason why Silicon Valley, for example, is more interesting than China for me is for ideological reasons. Because in Silicon Valley, you do see competing visions of post-capitalism, so to say, on offer that are much worse to, from where I stand than the capitalism that we have now. You know, on the one hand, you have this sort of hyper-capitalism vision where you even go beyond the commodity and nobody owns anything, but you have to pay for everything, mm -hmm. right? And they somehow sell it as sharing economy, but the idea behind sharing economy is that you do not really have enough money or you don't want to have enough money to buy anything. You just rent everything continuously, right? And you match it with some kind of service economy on top of that. And the picture that they would like to present is this world where ultimately free from commodities but completely dependent on providers of services, right? And a lot of, even at the B2B level, between businesses, there is something similar going on, where more and more firms not just sell you products, they actually sell you services on top of those products, and products might even come in for free to some extent, right? It's a very different picture, but there is another one, and I'll stop here and I'll give it, uh, the word to Paul. There is another vision where, uh, you know, the idea is to, go, to, to rebuild our technological infrastructures with a much more hierarchical kind of paradigm, where we'll actually mm. be able to reestablish uh, the pecking order in society, because there are a lot of people on the so-called alt-right in America who are very unsatisfied with the egalitarianism of Google and Facebook. So mm -hmm. Google treats all the information equally, you know, to some extent, and they would like actually our reputation, our standing in society, our class, our race, our culture, be reflected in somehow our digital reputation, and that our digital reputation then be incorporated in how all those other platforms treat us. I think those are, to some extent, are two different visions, but they are departures, to some extent, to a traditional traditional capitalist system mm. and the welfare state and democracy tied to it as the way to kind of stabilize its internal contradictions. Can I just say, I don't disagree with you about the possibility of a kind of neo-feudalism. Mm. Uh, we don't disagree at all. I tend to appro approach the problem of, however, for me, the problem is how can we drive a transition? Now, mm -hmm. people who've read the book will be aware that the, the big source, one of the big sources of difference between me and classic Marxism is I also say that the proletariat is not the driver of the transition. But what you're saying reminds me of what, why it's, what I say everybody networked is the potential driver of the transition because mm -hmm. we have an interest. Uh, in a way that in Marxism, the proletariat had the interest in ab ab abolishing capitalism. We have an interest in preventing something. And, and it's, it's this. The, the ex-Marxist philosopher André Gortz in, 1980s, in the 1980s wrote a book called The Critique of Economic Reason. And what he's saying is that the, what they are forced to do is to force economic rationality into the non-economic. So we know, we, we, you know, uh, the, they will, uh, he predicted the rise in uh, compartmentalised sex work, for example. So before you just had what we called prostitution. Now you have sex work done in different compartments, down phone lines, down uh, t uh, video lines, the table dancing that happens. Gortz predicted all this. And he said what will happen is that 
actually, the end point of this is ordinary relationships with, between people will become monetized in a way that is actually uh, capitalist. So it turns non market activity, relationships, sex, into market activity. Now, Gort says, A, there's a physical limit, like Marx says with the working day. You know, there are 24 hours in the day, so there's a physical limit to how much non-market activity can be found. Uh, but the other thing is, and this is where I'll finish, Gort says, eventually, this process challenges us. We're, we're like the boiling frog. Eventually, we actually say, no, enough of my life is already commercialised that I have, I have a limit beyond which you cannot come in to the mind and body and activity of me anymore, and I will refuse it. And in that, in other words, my, what, what, where my optimism or my, the, my story of transition and resistance comes from is I think that people have a limit to, beyond which they, they will not accept the economic rationalisation of their entire human life. So maybe that's... Yeah, I just wanted to sure. say that's where, I, where my optimism uh, story yeah. comes from. Well, sex work in Japan is, of course, done by robots. So this yeah, is yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Questions from the audience? Please. Yes, a question to Mos Morozov. Could you perhaps elaborate on decentralization technology yeah. as a threat to these giants? Yeah, so I promised you 10 minutes of what's to be done, which never happened. <laughs> uh, so I think that's a follow-up. The question to was <laughs> about decentralization. Uh, decentralization yeah. or centralization? Decentralization. De decentralization. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, th th there are, of course, a lot of valuable initiatives out there that try to tackle one part of the sort of dominant landscape that these firms have built. So some are trying to democratize identity provision. Some are trying to democratize data ownership. Some are trying in a very rudimentary way to democratize artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, the blockchain, for example, plays a very big role in facilitating some of those decentralized solutions. The problem is most of those initiatives, you know, and I participate and observe many of them, especially the level of cities. You know, now I live in Barcelona, we have a fantastic project called Deco, which, for example, tries to give citizens ownership of data and have the data shared with municipalities so you can at least think about ways to transcend Uber and Airbnb. The problem with many of these initiatives is that they lack the scale and the backing in order to actually create a robust ecosystem, so to say, which can actually change the, the, the terms of the game. Because, you know, if Amazon invests $30 billion a year into AI and the city invests, you know, 30000 you are not really anywhere uh, matching even closely. And the same goes for blockchain. You know, in some sense, there are a lot of valid aspirations and utopian visions for what the blockchain can do. However, 90% of funding that's now being poured into blockchain-related applications and developments comes from the financial sector. It mm -hmm. comes from FinTech, which more or less ensures that uh, the, the most uses of blockchain over the next 10 years will be to facilitate your interactions with the financial system, right? Which is, is, is a pity, but I think it's also quite normal. Like, you really need to repurpose some public money. You know, if in Norway you would like to spend, you know, 1% of the sovereign wealth fund into experimenting with decentralized technologies, you know, I'm more than happy to get involved. But, you know, <laughs> I, I just do not see anybody seriously wanting to put serious money on the table to do anything that will actually scale them. We have a lot of templates, a lot of pilots. Uh, they do not translate into something that actually needs the resources to, to grow into something challenging. I would say for hoping uh, for for that one percent to be spent by by by, by the petroleum fund. Petroleum fund, you haven't met the Norwegian treasury yet. <laughs> I have they heard. I have heard of them. Of the I have heard of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ford, uh, did you have any? Uh, Ford? Um, well, I, I again. I, so people, as it was said at the beginning, I, I don't uh, formally advise Corbyn, but I I do interact with them and try to be a sounding board. Uh, for their ideas. And uh, so the British Labour Party has done the following. It, it's going to do a trial of the basic income. It's going to, it's pledged to double the, um, the size of the cooperative sector, which won't be difficult because in Britain it, it's, it's a tiny cooperative sector. So beyond that, of course, the question then becomes what, what the British Labour Party, which is likely to form, I think, the next government, doesn't yet have is a written industrial policy, but it is working on one right now. And I think that those of us who are trying to influence it away from the traditional Keynesian, quasi-Marxist, you know, let's build a big, uh, let's build, build a dam kind of thing, are trying to say, actually, it's exactly in these areas of 
you know, not, so what does the state do normally? Mm -hmm. The state is doing AI, artificial intelligence, but it's doing it only in, in spaces where it doesn't step into the, sure. uh, into the remit of, of the artificial intelligence providers, private. Interestingly, and maybe somebody in the audience or maybe you know, I don't even know, I don't even have like a zoology of the AI system. I don't really know so which company is working on this kind of AI solution mm. and opposite to that. My impression is they're all working on non-compatible versions. Now, the state could say, we will create a framework in which artificial intelligence will be researched. Mm. Um, just as they did with, in World War II, you may know that, that it was impossible to make profit from a uh, patent uh, during World War II uh, in America. They, you can make profit from production, but the patent is not uh, a value proposition. We, could do, we don't even have to go that far. You could simply say, and I think we're, we're now going to start discussing this in, on the left in Britain, what, what is our AI policy? And as long as you have a laissez-faire policy, which is, you know, okay, get on with it, guys. You, do, you produce it, and it's good for, it, it will surely be good for society. You're not going to know. But if you have one that says, we, it, obviously, we're gonna reg you need to regulate it for safety, for ethics. But even more so, what, maybe the state should create a basic human infrastructure of blockchain plus uh, a transmission mechanism plus a platform, uh, a cooperative sort of, template the the state creates that and then says to the private and the non-profit sector you take this and do with this along the standard platform because what's going to happen I, I could guarantee if whether britain's in or out of uh, the european union what would happen if it was inside the european union the first thing is all those big companies mm -hmm. go to brussels and say stop the state doing this it must not be allowed to trespass on yes. our right to define what artificial intelligence is more questions from the audience? Please. Isn't, isn't one of the big problems the absolute non-knowledge of uh, the research authorities being those, the European Union, the Norwegian Research Council and those? Because they are not able to define frameworks. They are not able to put the framing conditions such that the bits and pieces at the end would work together. Well, maybe on Norway you can. Yeah, but I think, the I, think I, I agree to that, and it should be. This is more how, how the funding of research should be organized, and I think there should be much more. For example, there could be uh, a common uh, research uh, funding institution for all Nordic countries, for example. There will be more competition also for ideas and larger scales of things. And maybe there can be different research uh, funding institutions, research councils in the, in the countries, but they can compete in the end who achieve the best research mm. results. And then they will fund, I mm. think, better research. But I, it's, it's something mm. with the scale that you are saying. But I think, I think it is, uh, whether they have the expertise, uh, expertise, I don't know, but they can hire in people, of course, and that's mm. what they do. Can, so. can I make a point about, uh, there's an in interesting, um, Example with Japan with MITI, it's in, it, it, it's always had an industrial uh, uh, ministry, and in 2012 they they wrote a, a, a robotic strate strategy document. They said we we're too far behind in robotics. We have a labour shortage because of the immigration policy. Therefore, we need to come forward into the robotics industry, um, and they already have a big semiconductor industry and big mechanical engineering. So it was natural for them to want a robotics industry. So if you, the other thing is, I don't know why they translated this document into English. So the entire strategy is available in English if you want to read it. Uh, and it, it, it's like this. It's a spreadsheet that says, OK, problem. We're going to need d robots to look after old people in old people's homes. Right. And then it's, a li it's literally a project plan. And it goes, OK, change the law. The first thing they do is change the law so you allow a robot to look after a person. Next, find a, uh, a group of uh, elderly care homes prepared to be in a project with a robotics provider. Next, find some robots. And so you can see how industrial policy is made in Japan in very deep detail in the way a neoliberal government just doesn't do, a classic neoliberal government doesn't do. Now, I would say you take that template and you apply it to AI and, and you are, you are at the, of course, what they needed to do was to hire, as you suggest, 
all the experts they can to work on the government side to make this work. And what helps is to have an in industry ministry, which many of these neoliberal countries have, have uh, specifically eradicated. I mean, the British, it was a joke in Britain that the, the purpose of the Department for Trade and Industry, uh, what is now called the Business and Industry Department, its purpose was to abolish itself, to have no government interaction with the private sector at all. Can I, can I add something? Yeah. Um, so um, if you look at Europe, the European Union specifically, uh, you have two problems that I think explain why the situation is so bad. On the one hand, you have the political process in Brussels, including at the level of the Commission, quite captured by many of those firms. I mean, they've become one of the heaviest spenders on lobbying. Uh, if you look at the number of meetings that Google has had with representatives of the Commission, uh, if you look at how many times their lobbyists met with the Commission, it's one of the highest uh, per company in, in Brussels. The same, by the way, goes for Washington. So uh, many of those firms have become heavyweights in terms of setting the agenda in Europe. And the only opposition to them are not citizens, but the big telcos, which are much closer to the state at the national level. And it's them fighting the Googles and the Facebooks of the world. So it's Deutsche Telekom and uh, Telecom Italia, which is now called Team, fighting with uh, the Americans. Uh, the second problem there is that if you look at the political class in many European countries, they, they Despite everything you know here in America, Silicon Valley bad, they sell ads to Russians, you know, all this backlash. In a sense, politicians need Silicon Valley for structural reasons. This is what I've been trying to tell at, at the end. But you know, for them, it's a way to A, cut a lot of costs. I mean, you do not imagine how cheaper our life has become, our pre-production has become, because so much of it is underwritten by this, you know, either by the monopoly status of many of those firms, uh, or by the fact that uh, advertising pays for many of the activities we would otherwise have to pay out of pocket. And secondly, it also allows a lot of us, through Airbnb and Uber, to actually make up for the falls and the reductions in our actual wages with some kind of side uh, hustle <laughs> that we do, either by driving or renting our apartments through Airbnb and so forth. So as long as this industry has become almost a structurally necessary component of contemporary neoliberal systems, you will continue having politicians like Macron or like Renzi, or you had David Cameron previously in the United Kingdom, who go and celebrate it as the future, as the kind of you know, new digital capitalism that can get us away from all the problems created by finance. Right? And I think it's a very wrong narrative. We need to challenge it, and we need to actually draw the connection between digital, financial, geopolitical, because it's not, it's not an industry that exists outside of capitalism. It, 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 it's, it's avant-garde, so to say. Mm. So, it, it, we, we're going to change a little bit the perspective. So what we are discussing a little bit is social change and uh, economic and social change, so the revolutions, uh, but in a different style. I guess you remind you about a movie, a very good movie by Woody Allen. Uh, so that is uh, it's called the sleeper. Mm. So he goes to sleep and he wakes up in 2050 or something like that. And then it's, uh, the world is ruled by robots. And, uh, but two things are just the same as before. There are McDonald's everywhere. <laughs> and the revolutionaries have exactly the same dress as they had in 1968. And that's the point. The you guys, the revolutionaries, the we and you, have to, we have to change the, the strategy for the new revolution is going to be very different from uh, what we thought in the, in the beginning. We have to change clothes. We have to understand that, that capital is not so essential as it was before. It's much more so the, the, the essential thing for anything is in the heads of a lot of people. And that means that that is a decisive factor. And then we have to organize accordingly to, uh, to that. The way we run enterprises and we, the, capitalist, the capitalist role is, is, is really obsolete in, in, in my view. We have very good credit markets. We can fund labor managed firms, not labor in the old sense, but uh, these guys with big heads, uh, enterprises. And that is the new revolution. And then it's going to be market based, they're going to be maybe with zero cost for certain things, but, but, but it's very different from the old revolution. So get off with the 68 clothes and uh, <laughs> uh, face the new world, guys. That's. Uh, <laughs> Thank you.